On Friday, March 6, 2004, Nabil Qureshi and I, along with my wife and some others, went to Regent University to watch Mike Lacona debate Shabir Ali on the resurrection of Jesus. Nabil, who was still a Muslim, admitted that Mike won the debate. After the debate, Nabil and I spent a couple of hours arguing in his car. Nabil's biggest objection in that argument was to the Christian belief that Jesus died for the sins of others. Like so many other Muslims and many non-Muslims, Nabil insisted that it would be unjust and immoral for God to punish Jesus for what other people had done. We went back and forth on this, as we had on numerous prior occasions, but I eventually gave Nabil an example I wanted him to think about. I read to him the shortest letter of the Apostle Paul. In Paul's letter to Philemon, we read about a runaway slave named Onesimus. Onesimus had stolen some property from his master Philemon in order to pay for his escape and his trip to Rome. In Rome, Onesimus heard the gospel from the Apostle Paul, who was under arrest but was free to receive visitors, and Onesimus converted to Christianity. Onesimus helped Paul in prison for a while, until Paul told him that he wasn't going to spend the rest of his life as a fugitive slave. He was going to return to his master Philemon. But Onesimus wasn't going to return to Philemon empty-handed. He was going to bring Philemon a letter from the Apostle Paul, who knew Philemon. That letter is now part of the New Testament. In the letter, Paul writes to Philemon, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. Paul then agrees to pay Onesimus' debt for whatever he stole. Whatever he owes, I will pay it back. Paul also says, And I want you to receive him as you would receive me. Notice what Paul does here. He says, Onesimus, Onesimus is with me now. And because he's with me now, whatever he owes, charge that to me. I'm going to pay it. And when you see him coming, receive him as you would receive me, the Apostle Paul. Nabil and I went through this story, and I asked him, Are you seriously telling me that what Paul did was unjust and immoral? Was Paul unjust and immoral for paying another person's debt and applying his own status to that other person? Because that doesn't sound unjust and immoral to me. It sounds like the greatest thing anyone could ever do for someone. And Nabil replied, well, if you put it like that, I guess that could make sense. Nevertheless, the issue continued being a sticking point. As it turns out, most people don't have a problem with one man paying the debts of someone else until it becomes a debt owed to God. Then suddenly, we can't get our minds around one man paying the debts of someone else. But let's see if we can make sense of the Christian view. The first thing to keep in mind is that Christians didn't invent this idea. The idea was already present in the Jewish scriptures and has developed as part of rabbinic Judaism until today. Here's Dr. Michael Brown. There's an interesting saying that you find throughout rabbinic literature, and it's used right to this day, mitatan shel tzadikim techaper, the death of the righteous atones. It atones for the sins of the generation. It is a concept found in traditional Judaism right until this day. So when a famous rabbi dies at the eulogy, at the funeral, they'll cry out, may his death be an atonement for our generation. You say, well, what, what's the concept? Look at it that all of us are guilty before God and must pay for our sins. So let's look at it that we have a debt on a credit card and we all owe a million dollars and we make a dollar a day. We could, we could never possibly pay it back. But there's somebody mega wealthy. He, he's got credit cards for trillions of dollars. And he says, put it on my tab and let him go free. So he, because of his credit worthiness, can pay for what we've done. So in Judaism, it's believed that the ultimate atonement for one's sins is death. So for example, if a murderer was going to be put to death in, in ancient Jewish law, he would confess and say, may my death be atonement. In other words, I'm guilty. 
I've taken a life. May my life now pay for that. Well, what if there's a wicked generation? What if it's a typical generation of human beings? We're guilty. We should be judged by God. All of us deserve death. What if someone so righteous is among us that this person can pay for all of our guilt? His credit worthiness is so high that he can pay for all the things that we've done. So rabbinic Judaism asks these questions. You know, what about when little children die? Why do they die? Well, it, it pays for the sins of the generation. It's they're innocent. So they're like the lightning rod. They attract the, the wrath. They didn't deserve it, but they died in our place. This explains in, in rabbinic Judaism some of the mystery of suffering. So here you have a godly, righteous person, a famous rabbi. He's 50 years old. He's a community leader. He prays. He's, he's a wonderful man. And suddenly he, he's smitten and dies. Why? Well, he was paying for the sins of the generation. This is found throughout rabbinic tradition, and it's something that's even used to comfort mourners to this day. Well, where does it come from? It ultimately comes from the Hebrew Bible. It ultimately comes from the scriptures. Think of the whole sacrificial system in Leviticus 17, 11, that the blood makes atonement. And what does the famous rabbinic commentator Rashi say in the 11th century? It is life for life. It is the principle of substitution. So for example, on the day of atonement, Leviticus 16, that the goat that's sent out into the wilderness, the so-called scapegoat, scapegoat, that the priest would lay his hands on that goat and confess over it the sins of the nation. And the goat, the innocent goat, would then carry it into the wilderness. And by the time of this second temple in Jesus' day, they'd actually throw the goat off a cliff. So the goat would take the sins of the nation on its own shoulders, the innocent animal dying for the guilty sinner. We see it in Numbers 35, the atoning power of the death of the high priest. There we read that bloodshed pollutes the land and the only payment for it is the blood of the slayer. So you murder, bloodshed pollutes the land. Your life is taken, now the scales are even. What if it happened accidentally? What if you're chopping with your ax and the ax head goes flying off and kills your best friend? Well, there's bloodshed, the scales are uneven, it has to be righted, the family has the right to take your life, or you could flee to a city of refuge and stay there the rest of your life, or when the high priest died, you'd be released, because his death as the intercessor for the nation would then pay for that bloodshed. His death would compensate for your death and you'd go free. So you see these concepts. Uh, you see it when there's a situation with a famine in David's day and he seeks the Lord. Why is this happening? Well, it's because of the bloodshed of Saul. And, and he has to take descendants of Saul and give them over to the people that were sinned against by Saul. And when they die, then the famine is relieved. And then, of course, we have it most clearly laid out in the picture of substitutionary atonement in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Verse 6 says, Kulanu katson ta'inu. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one turned to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the guilt of all of us. So the perfectly righteous one dies for the sins of the whole world. It, it is substitutionary atonement. It is God saying to a guilty world, you could never pay for your sins. You could never make things right. You're guilty and you should suffer damnation because of it. The perfectly righteous son says to his father, I'll take the guilt and sin of the world on my shoulders. It, it would be uh, it, like a, if a million Catholics were rounded up and terrorists were going to kill them. And the Pope says, take my life instead, because he has that value for the Catholic Church. Or if a famous rabbi said to his community that was held hostage, take my life instead. And the terrorists take him. It counts for the rest of the lives. How much more the Messiah dying for the sins of the world. Substitutionary atonement clearly laid out in the Hebrew Scriptures, reaffirmed in the New Testament, and found to this day in Jewish tradition. The second thing to keep in mind is that even today we have situations where the wrongs of one person or entity are applied to another person or entity. Dr. William Lane Craig explains. The principal objection to the biblical doctrine of substitutionary atonement is that one innocent person cannot die for the crimes committed by another person. And very often it's claimed that we have no experience whatsoever of this notion of the transfer of moral responsibility or guilt from one party to another blameless party who is then punished for the crimes of the actor. 
This claim is, in fact, demonstrably false. In our uh, Anglo-American justice system, the practice of what's called vicarious liability is a widespread and essential feature of our justice system. Um, it is applied especially to the relationship between employers and employees. Crimes committed by an employee in the discharge of his duties can be imputed to uh, his employer, even though the employer is utterly blameless with respect to these crimes, so that the employer then will be held vicariously liable for the crimes committed by his subordinate. And this, it seems to me, is a very close analogy to the doctrine of imputation of sin, that our sins were imputed to Jesus Christ, who then was punished in our stead. And so I think that we actually have in our justice system a, a very close analogy um, to the idea of the imputation of sin and the idea of someone bearing vicariously the punishment for a third party. In other words, if someone who works for McDonald's spills a milkshake and doesn't point it out and you slip on the milkshake, McDonald's can be held liable even though McDonald's didn't do anything. A specific person did something. If that person is with McDonald's, McDonald's can be held accountable. What if someone is with Jesus and Jesus willingly takes responsibility for that person's actions? What if Jesus, the divine son, says to the father, this guy is with me now. Whatever he owes, charge it to my account. And I want you to receive him as you would receive me. Can he do that? Who in the world are we to say no? The gospel is a message about how the righteousness of Jesus is applied to us. We're not good enough. We're not righteous enough. If we're going to be with God, we need a righteousness that comes from someone else, not from ourselves. The Apostle Paul was once a violent persecutor of Christians. He was forgiven because of what Jesus did for him. And Paul became the most epic preacher of God's mercy and forgiveness the world has ever seen. One day, Paul shared the gospel with a runaway slave. He sent that runaway slave back to his master, but he agreed to pay the runaway slave's debts, and he asked that his status as an apostle be applied to the runaway slave. Do you think the gospel affected Paul's thinking? We don't know exactly when Onesimus was freed by Philemon, but he was freed. Onesimus was eventually ordained by the apostles and took over as bishop of Ephesus when St. Timothy stepped down. Onesimus was later imprisoned during a Roman persecution and was executed for his defense of Jesus Christ. And so, a fugitive slave, a thief, a man with nothing to look forward to in life except being beaten and branded, became Bishop Onesimus, Saint Onesimus, martyr Onesimus. Welcome to the gospel. Of course, our Muslim friends are still going to object to the idea of one man paying for the sins of others, but as usual, that's only because they don't read their own sources. If they had read their own sources, they would know that their own prophet repeatedly declared that Allah is going to punish other people for the sins of Muslims. If you'd like to read some of these sources, be sure to watch my video, How Could God Punish Jesus for the Sins of Others? Answering a Muslim Objection. As for you Muslims who are watching, and I know you're watching, after you click on that video and you see what your prophet actually said, be sure to ask yourselves, why have my leaders always kept this hidden from me? And if they've kept this hidden from me, what else are they hiding?